I'll just give an introduction, then I'll tell you when to start. You can start by then, ma'am. Sure. Okay. Hello, viewers. Good evening, everybody. I welcome you all to this online class on the behalf of Indian Medical College. Dear viewers, in today's session, we have our beloved Dr. Midushri, a consultant microbiologist from Mahavir Cancer Sanstan Patna with us today. She is having a plenty of teaching and a practical experience behind her. She'll be taking a class on a lab diagnosis on tuberculosis today. Good evening and welcome, ma'am. It is an immense pleasure to have you here with us now. Thank you. Uh, dear viewers, if you have any doubts or clarification, you can just type them in the comment section below and your queries will be clarified by her at the end of the session. Ma'am, you can now start your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as I have been as a clinical microbiologist, so lab diagnosis of tuberculosis literally comes under my area. So just to start with the introduction, what tuberculosis is for an Indian. So uh, for Western countries or for developed nations, I should say, tuberculosis is still an uh, uncommon uh, disease. But uh, for uh, Indian scenario, it's like an endemic having every 10th person carrying the tuberculosis in, with them. So... Uh, I, we, uh, we can just uh, understand the importance of diagnosis of tuberculosis in that way. Not because it's so common, but because of the complications it brings along with it. So let's start uh, our presentation. And uh, I hope I'll be able to make you understand any basic thing uh, regarding the lab diagnosis of tuberculosis. So as I told you, it's one of the most important causes of morbidity and mortality worldwide, but more common in the developing nations as such. And the high incidence is mainly recorded in the low income countries where they are not capable of uh, avoiding the overcrowding or uh, taking the preventive measures of the respiratory illnesses. So uh, the diagnosis is many a times overlooked also in these type of countries. So the diagnosis gets delayed and the delayed diagnosis and many a times inappropriate therapy by the common uh, physicians in the local who don't uh, take tuberculosis to be a part of treatment. The, it represents one of the shortcoming of tuberculosis care, which usually uh, leaves the tuberculosis carrying patient in the society and allows them to transmit to one to the other person. So what about tuberculosis? What organs, What, where it affects? Tuberculosis most commonly affects the lungs and we are usually uh, the common pan, the lawman, layman, I usually understands tuberculosis as an infection of lung, the respiratory tract as such. So we know much about pulmonary tuberculosis, but with the coming days with more of immunocompromised uh, scenario in our uh, surroundings, now we find any organ to be involved and that is referred as extra pulmonary tuberculosis. So extra pulmonary tuberculosis, the most common site includes the lymphatic system, the lymph nodes, which includes around 16% of the extra pulmonary tuberculosis. Other comes the bone and joints, most commonly the hip and knee joints and the spine and then genital urinary system and meninges and CNS comes to the last by including being included as one percent and as I told you TB of lymph nodes with or without parenchymal involvement is the most frequent form and it usually affects the children and the immunocompromised. Extra pulmonary tuberculosis is literally uncommon in uh, immune um, competent hosts. So what are the symptoms? How do we actually identify that the patient is, is suffering from the tuberculosis? So starting with the pulmonary tuberculosis disease, most common is the cough, usually prolonged cough for three weeks or something with or without sputum production. It's not like every time a tuberculosis patient will be having a huge amount of sputum production or a, um, a sputum producing cough every time. It might be a dry cough even which can um, 
be a symptom of tuberculosis. Along with cough, many a times a patient might appreciate the streak of blood in it and uh, might be even a great, bit higher amount of blood, which is known as hemoptysis. And accompanied with this may, may be a, the chest pain, loss of appetite and unexplained weight loss. The patient will not be able to explain why the weight loss, uh, because one reason might be the lowered appetite as such, but uh, the lowered appetite, till, till the patient appreciates the lower appetite, he has usually lost weight that by that time. And uh, night sweats with evening rise of temperature most uh, appropriately and fatigue. Of course, the respiratory tract is involved and fatigue needs to be one of the common symptoms. So with this, we can diagnose the we can actually approach to the diagnosis of uh, pulmonary tuberculosis unless and until we get the confirmations from the di di lab diagnostics. And uh, coming to the extra pulmonary tuberculosis, the same symptoms, the loss of appetite, the unexplained weight loss, night sweats, evening rise of temperature, fatigue, et cetera, can be accompanied by the symptoms related to the part affected. For instance, in uh, TB kidney, we can find urine. Uh, with blood, so called as uh, hematuria. TB meningitis can present with headache or confusion. So spine with back pain and TB larynx with me will be presenting the with hoarseness and similarly. So how to approach to the lab diagnosis? Once we are uh, having the symptoms in our mind and having a high suspicion of tuberculosis, now it's the time when we have to confirm it as tuberculosis is present or not. Because once the tuberculosis is ignored, it might lead to the transmission to one to other patient, as well as the deterioration of the patient's condition and several other complications following. So confirmation is one of the essential thing as soon as the suspicion arises. Many of the screening tests are available before the lab diag the confirmatory lab diagnosis are uh, carried on. For instance, um, although in endemic country, Montus test doesn't make much a difference, but still many of the physicians actually uh, go for the Montus test with uh, the PPD or tuberculin uh, precipitate. And uh, we usually look for the enduration formed uh, with the tuberculin reagent. And as I told you, it's a screening test having a very low sensitivity and specificity. Usually the immune suppressed many a times don't even present a positive test, but if they are even uh, suffering from tuberculosis. So let us start with the lab diagnosis part of the tuberculosis. So selection of most suitable test for detection of MTB is based on the reason of the context for testing. Why you are going to test, why you are you having a suspicion of tuberculosis? So as I told about the MONTU screening, uh, Particularly for I have, what I have seen with my uh, clinical and, non, and lab experiences that for pulmonary tuberculosis or for uh, um, extra pulmonary, even if we are not including eye of thalm, then the MONTU has relatively less uh, importance. But for of thalm patients, we, usually I have seen even a very... Um, low range of measurement of uh, five between five to 10 millimeter gives a positive importance of MONTU. So for what reason we are testing, that's very important. And what tests we are selecting for that, that is even um, uh, Im important to us. And besides, we have to check the test availability. We can't go for very high generation tests in the local uh, village area or PHC area where we are not having uh, culture facilities or molecular test facilities. We can't wait for that to approach the diagnosis. So where the tests, what tests are available with that we can select, we can approach to the way to diagnose. And cost effectiveness, of course. If you ask a very poor, very um, low income patient from and from a uh, developing country as such to go for high costing molecular tests and the uh, culture tests, which uh, which cost somewhere around 10,000, 12,000, it will be difficult for the patient to approach. 
anyways these days it's quite uh, easy for them to um, get these tests done because government of india through who and find ha are having so many different uh, centers for the culture and for uh, dst that is drug sensitivity testing so it's not uh, that bad condition as it was earlier so we can um, then too we should actually have in our mind how much cost effective the test is and how much it is required for every patient with, which come under the suspicious criteria for tuberculosis so starting with the bacteriological examination of clinical specimen so when we were talking about tuberculosis we talked about pulmonary and extra pulmonary tuberculosis so depending on the site of affliction what a clinician suspects the sample is decided accordingly and that sample is collected and sent to the laboratory for processing and for the review and the basic test what we go for detection of tuberculosis for diagnosis of tuberculosis is the detection of the responsible bacteria that is the acid fast bacilli or i should i say mycobacterium tuberculosis and uh, why acid fast bacilli because these bacteria are having a mycolic acid cell wall and this mycolic acid cell wall doesn't allow them to go for a routine staining which we actually conduct for different bacteria in microbiology lab so very uh, different test uh, very different staining is done for these bacilli in which the uh, 25% sulfuric acid that is a uh, uh moderate concentration of acid is used to decolorize the smear and if the smear is having bacteria which are not decolorized with these uh, um, high concentration moderate concentration acid then we call them as acid fast bacteria or acid fast bacilli so when we are capable enough to see these bacteria under microscope these acid fast bacilli we literally have the first evidence of the presence of mycobacteria in our specimen the specimen as i told you for a pulmonary tuberculosis if the patient is having sputum production then sputum is of course the best sample and why best because easiest to collect and uh, easy to be transported to the laboratory by the patient himself not dependent or uh, not any type of invasive uh, procedure is involved but uh, if the patient is having no production of sputum but the high suspicion of tuberculosis indicates the test to be done then uh, the patient has to be uh, suggested for a induced sputum or even the bronchoscopy method of collection of the bron uh, the bronchial wash uh, is actually appropriate for going for these uh, examinations these investigations so what actually i do i mean by acid fast staining so we can go by uh, either the direct microscopy method in which we can use the stains like uh, zeal nielsen stain where we go for hot method where we actually uh, use hot carbol fixin or we actually heat carbol fixin when it is on the smear itself so this is the hot method or we can use the kinyon method in which we allow the carbol fixin to stay longer on the smear but the heating process is avoided a uh, usually kinoin method is not used for m tuberculosis it's preferably preferably used for uh, other mycobacterium which have a uh, uh, thinner mycolic acid wall and uh, usually use uh, usually are um, decolorized by a lower percentage of sulfuric acid like there we used 25% of sulfuric acid here we will be using just 5% of sulfuric acid so kinyon method is preferable and um, even these don't alter the morphological bacteriological arrangement on the smear the second method is the fluorescent microscopic method here we use the fluorochrome stains the most common is the oramin o stain or the oramin rhodamin dyes and with this the bacteria actually get stained with the fluorescent dyes and under the fluorescent microscope we can actually see the bacilli fluorescing between the dark background dark brown brown black type of background so it's easy to make out under the fluorescent microscope of course and these days um, in india also for uh, diagnostics uh, from the um, in gengo and 
comprehensive program actually, National Tuberculosis Control Program. There are um, provisions of the fluorescent microscope so that may, several st stain smear, several patient samples can be handled in lesser time. With fluorescent, it is easier to make out the bacteria, the presence of the bacteria in the smear. So what I uh, spoke was uh, the specimen collection processing. Processing is the uh, one of the step in the processing is staining, make, preparing the smear and staining them. And after staining the smear and examining under microscope, the other big responsibility is to classify the smear. And that is actually according to the WHO method, which actually tells if the smear is having more than nine bacilli per field, we call the smear as strongly positive smear. And the patient from which the sam this type of sample is collected, we, uh, we uh, actually grade them as uh, probably very infectious. And if the patient is from our indoor uh, department, we try to isolate them um, and uh, take all the respiratory precautions, transmission precautions in that case. And if we find one to nine bacilli per field, again, we call it as strongly positive, but the smear result is three, three plus. And again, the patient is very infectious. Similarly, if it is uh, one to nine per 10 field, we have viewed 10 fields. And in that 10 fields, if you find one to nine bacilli, then it is moderately posit positive and probably the patient is infectious. Um, the reason telling as probably is how we are actually taking the infection control measures, how much the patient is exposed in society and what type of actually therapy he is going through. Has he started his treatment? Is he undergoing the treatment? And uh, is he within the two months of the treatment period? So all these actually uh, um, make us use the phrase probably. So one plus is one to nine bacilli per hundred fields, which is um, moderately positive. Again, the patient might be infectious. And when we hardly see one to two bacilli in 300 fields, then it is known as weakly positive. And in that case, the patient's uh, sample can be um, requested to be submitted once again. And again, a smear can be prepared and other confirmatory tests can be actually attempted for. And if we find no acid bas fast bacilli uh, in the 300 fields, then we tell it to be negative and probably the patient is not infectious. Again, probably not infectious actually denotes that uh, might be the spare what we have prepared is not having the bacilli, might be the specimen, might be uh, having uh, bacilli in other smears if we would have prepared. Um, so what actually is deciding this uh, count of bacilli? That is the number of bacilli in the specimen. It is actually, um, with many studies we have concluded that for a smear to be positive with, uh, with the stain, around 5,000 to 10,000 bacilli needs to be present in about one ml of the specimen. So we can just conclude that how uh, the sensitivity is lower because the specimen is collected once and it might, that, that particular specimen might not be having 5,000 bacilli or might be having lesser than 5,000 bacilli and the smear will not be showing the AFP and then we will be denoting it as a negative smear and the patient will be carrying tuberculosis but they will be having a negative result for it. So uh, we can't, and if the smear is strongly positive, we can easily conclude the patient to be carrying the TB bacilli and to be infected with it and with the risk of transmitting it. But if the smear becomes negative, then definitely higher uh, tests need to be done. The positive point with smear examination is, is it is a quick procedure. Once the sample arrives the laboratory, then within 24 hours, the report can be delivered to the 
clinician about the patient's status about tuberculosis. But smear examination permits only the presumptive diagnosis because many a times AFB present in the smear might be AFB other than mycobacterium tuberculosis. And many TB patients, as I told, might be negative AFB smears, which does not exclude the TB. So what to do? They'll be going for something better and that is culture. Culture remains the gold standard for lab diet confirmation of tuberculosis. And definitely when anything is growing with you, growing in your laboratory, on your culture plate, on your media, then you are sure that it, the specimen was carrying live organism within it. And when you have a, um, a organism, when you have harvested an organism in your laboratory, then definitely you can go for the drug sensitivity testing and the genotyping and whatsoever test you want to go with it. So positive cultures for M tuberculosis literally confirms the diagnosis of TB. But again, the same scenario, if there is absence of positive culture, then the TB disease has to be diagnosed with the help of the clinicians and their epidemiological diagnostic profile. Because a negative growth, negative culture does not readily exclude the TB disease. For culture examinations, what do we have? What provisions? We have solid media which can be inoculated with the specimen, with the processed specimen. And this will allow the detection of the bacteria in three to six weeks. A pretty long time as such for the diagnosis in between the patient might be transmitting infection to so many of his close contacts. And the second is the broth culture system. The many of the um, uh, systems which are available are the Bactic system, the MJIT system, and uh, Versatrek, MD Bact, etc. These broad systems are actually the liquid culture media system, and they take hardly four to fourteen days for the growth to ha happen. And with this, we can go for the diagnosis of the presence of MTB. And with these growths, we can further process to the drug sensitivity testing. So for all the patients, when we have a Tuberculosis isolate, MTB isolate, we go for the testing with the first line anti tuberculosis drug, that is the isoniazid, rifampicin, ethambutol, and pyrazinamide. So, earlier when tuberculosis was um, not of this variant, what we are carrying right now, the, the highly resistant bacteria, drug sensitivity was not uh, undertaken, and we were not having the facilities even. So, Every patient who were under the suspicion of uh, tuberculosis, they were uh, prescribed with these four medicines. Many a times, a patient with cough for might be 10 days or a week days, they were uh, under the suspicion of tuberculosis and they were openly prescribed these drugs. These treatments are not like the routine antibiotics we prescribe for the other bacterial infection. So they are, the treatment go on is a prolonged treatment might be continued for six months, nine months, depending on the patient's status. And this prolonged treatment actually brings to the non-compliant of the uh, drug intake by the patient as such. And this reduced, uh, as soon as the patient recovered, might be not having tuberculosis or having tuberculosis and started recovering in 10 days or, uh, or two weeks time they became gradually uh, non-compliant to medicine, not taking that drugs in time or gradually leaving it as such, becoming a defaulter. And once that bacteria is not er eradicated completely, they might again uh, start um, reproducing and uh, the patient again comes to the earlier stage where he was. But this time might be the drugs he was taking earlier might not work with the present scenario. So the earlier that uh, routine use of and uh, literally not the wise decision of using the first line for every patient having cough and evening fever without going up to the diagnostics level. And this has led to the scenario of resistance. So nowadays what we have to do, we have go to do, go for the second line drug sensitivity testing with fluoroquinolone, amycacin, anamycin or capremycin. And these uh, are specific uh, line drugs. So they are actually restricted to patients, the specimens 
in which the prior tb disease treatment had been undertaken and either they were defaulter or did not uh, respond to the treatment as such we actually go for the second line uh, dst for the contact of uh, a patient who had uh, anti tb drug resistance that is mdi tb patients or and the patients who from the first time only demonstrate the resistance to the first line anti tb drugs and for uh, patients who who are undertaking anti tb drugs they are uh, called for retesting on this uh, after two months and depending on the result of the specimen either they are afb positive or the culture comes positive the if again the positive cultures are present after 3 months of treatment then they should be undertaken the second line drug tested drug dst so that we can actually detect the resistance if ever it is present so a patient is die what actually mdr and xdr is what we are talking about mdr is the disease if the organism uh, isolated from a patient is resistant to the two basic drugs dicenias and rifampicin of the first line treatment and the extensive drug resistant tb is xdr tb in which if the tb isolate the isolate the organism isolated from the patient is resistant to isoniazid rifampicin any fluoroquinolone and at least one of the three injectable second line drug that is amikacin kanamycin or capreomycin Uh, something about immunodiagnostics that is detection of uh, either antigen or antibody though uh, not of that much importance as such because they have a very low sensitivity and poor specificity they cross reacting with other uh, mycobacterium present in the specimen or the contaminants in the laboratory as such so uh, usually not of much importance in the diagnostics but just to mention we can go for the detection of um, say um, the antigens in the present in the mycobacterium the most important being the lipoaerobinomannan which can be detected in various uh, body fluids and um, for antibodies we can go for detection of antibodies against the lipoaerobinomannans or uh, Uh, 38 kd kinodalton uh, antigens present in the mycobacterium now coming to the molecular detection of mtb this is the most current uh, development in the diagnostic in the mycobacterium diagnostics and the most important method is the nucleic amplification uh, nucleic acid amplification tests they usually amplify the nucleic acid that is the dna or rna segments so that the presence of mycobacterium in the microorganism in the specimen can be made uh, rapidly and the most common format is the pcr that is polymerase chain reaction <coughs> excuse me they rapidly detect and uh, reliably diagnose the uh, organism in the specimen in hours Uh, usually the pcr result comes in 4 uh, hours and these days when there are so many automatized method of uh, extraction of nucleic acid and amplification methods uh, we can report the the specimens within 4 to 5 hours to the clinicians but a single negative nucleic acid test uh, should not be a definitive result to exclude that disease so again the clinician clinical suspicion is the uh, most important thing to be under consideration the as far as single test is concerned even a single afp smear is not recommended at least two smears and preferably the morning morning sample are uh, the best chosen and um, once the two specimens are coming negative for uh, afp smears by zeden stain or by fluorescent stain only then we can go for more confirmatory tests like um, culture or uh, nucleic acid test although i would not say that we should not go for culture once the patient is um, having afp positive smear culture should definitely be adopted because it helps for the dst testing also 
So besides the uh, detection of the presence of the mycobacterium, molecular detection helps with uh, one more important thing that is drug resistance. Although drug resistance was being easily diagnosed with uh, cultures also, but it takes a long time till we can conclude that the patient is uh, MDR or an XDR patient. So molecular detection of, about the drug resistance helps us to contain the uh, infection and isolate the patients so that they don't transmit the XDR, which is actually the worst of the problems arising due to tuberculosis. So what? how does molecular detection helps in drug resistance? They actually detect the presence of genes, the modification, the mutations in the genes which are responsible for the resistance in the uh, organism, the mycobacterium tuberculosis. So we have various molecular assays which can allow us the rapid detection of the drug resistance through the identification of these mutations. So this may help us to guide the uh, initial therapy or even to switch from the first line to the second line therapy or uh, again uh, withdrawing the treat tuberculosis treatment So. So we have two examples, that is line probe assay and the real-time PCR. These two assays, the molecular assays, help us to detect the uh, mutations in the genes. And uh, the, the real-time PCR from uh, expert, the gene expert, actually helps us to uh, detect the rifampicin resistance uh, uh, and the, detect the presence of mycobacterium together. So it can diagnose the presence of mycobacterium as well as detect the presence of the resistance to rifampicin as such. <coughs> so what actually are the advantages and disadvantages of molecular tests? Molecular tests have a rapid turnaround time, what I told you. It is um, somewhere around four to five hours. And as far as uh, gene expert is concerned, it's just an hour's time in a in one hour, sample processing as well as reporting can be done, the real-time PCR method, in which we can easily, um, within an hour, report to the clinician for the presence of mycobacterium tuberculosis, as well as the presence of the resistance or the sensitive, sensitive uh, to the uh, rifampicin. And besides that, it is highly sensitive and specific because they are, um, um, detecting the genes. So it's not possible like they will be coming positive for some other organism because the few specific target genes are selected for the tests. And what is disadvantage? As I told you, it's molecular method using beacons. So it is expensive and requires expertise. Not everyone can go for the routine uh, as we do for the routine. It's not like every routine uh, laboratory technician go for the molecular tests. Besides, because of the presence of uh, detection of presence of genes uh, is the um, basis behind the test. So uh, it might not differentiate between the active infection because DNA from the dead organisms can also be present in the specimen because of antibiotic treatment going on. So it's not able to, it is uh, not able to differentiate between the active infection and the uh, regressing infection or infection which is getting treated. And besides that, the other limitations are the clinical relevance of some mutations remains unknown. We are not able to make out all the mutations present. So if the test tells no mutations present, then the patient might be carrying uh, MDR, TB and resistance, which is not actually um, still identified. So not all biological mechanisms of resistance are known as a result. Uh, we are not uh, yet knowing all the mechanisms. So uh, if uh, no mutation is detected, so resistance can't be ruled out. The patient might be carrying MDR or HDR and we are not able to make it out. And so it, besides all these going on, the molecular test, the nucleic amplification test, the conventional growth method is the best method which can be a confirmatory thing for the diagnosis of tuberculosis as well as for the drug sensitivity testing. But conjunction with molecular results is definitely important because of the rapidity. If NNA, that is nucleic acid amplification test comes negative, then too we can wait till the culture results are also negative. And 
with the nucleic acid test negative and the culture test negative smear negative we can have a guide towards diagnosis of other diseases which are having symptoms close to tuberculosis so that we can guide the clinicians to think over um, with some other clinical diagnosis other differential diagnosis also so we can conclude like uh there are so many rapid high specificity molecular assays for tb identification and drug resistance detection but as i told you it can't replace the standard diagnostic method of microbiological detection that is the uh, smear preparation and cultures besides that the clinical and radiological assessment definitely the most important thing which together helps to make the diagnosis confirm and the confer the conventional dst testing um is uh, actually helping us know whether the infection is active or not and the sputum smear negative patients can easily be uh, detected because for sputum uh, smear to be positive as i told you the the, the specimen should contain somewhere around 5000 to 10000 bacilli per milliliter of the specimen but for the culture even 50 to 100 bacilli present in one ml of specimen is sufficient to harvest the organism and going for detection as well as for the sensitivity testing so with extra pulmonary specimens also similar the case is similar because there the load of the bacilli present in the specimen is still low and in that case the smear usually has a very very low sensitivity in that case we can go for the cultures which are the best we can go for proper processing of the specimen concentrating it so that we get the good uh, uh, sample which can be um, used for the liquid culture or can be inoculated on the solid culture media and with that we can go for the diagnosis of the tuberculosis in the uh, extra pulmonary site or the lungs so Uh, thank you and uh, i hope i have uh, tried my best to make it easy for the basic uh, understanding of the tuberculosis lab diagnosis and uh, the session is open for questions thank you thank you so much ma'am it was a wonderful session ma'am let's wait for few minutes for the queries from the viewers yeah sure so meanwhile uh, we still have some interesting talks by our experts in upcoming session tomorrow Okay. Can you please stop sharing your slide, please? Okay. Thank you so much, and I hope all the viewers and audience would have enjoyed this session. And uh, please uh, share our YouTube channel and the Facebook page, and uh, the access. the recorded videos and mcqs and the announcement for the other sessions are, can be uh, uh, made through our facebook page and for tomorrow session so these are the topics for tomorrow session the first session uh, will be taken by uh, dr kanimuri from srm medical college and the topic spinal cord lesions and next topic is by the rheumatic fever by asitha vadaproy from mg medical college at the 5 to 6 pm and the session 3 is by dr ashwini pujahari from afmc pune uh, on the topic surgical uh, jaundice okay i ask you don't have any queries uh, or any clarification we shall wind up the session on thank you so much it thank was you. very informative session and thank you for accepting the invitation uh, thank you so much thank you viewers see you all in the next session tomorrow